Maggie, thank you so much. Nellie, thank you. Quincy, Jess, you guys are great. Thanks so much for hosting us and having this panel. Um, our panel is Mapping a Path to Digital Democracy, a Federal Perspective. And um, we're going to talk about how OSM and U.S. federal government and uh, programs can develop new and better data. We're mm -hmm. together, increase the sense of engagement, and meet program objectives through collaborating. Um, my name is Eddie Pickle. I work for Crunchy Data. I know many of you because of I'm old and I've been around. Um, but uh, through, uh, especially many of them through uh, Geo Day, where uh, we work to try to together open data, open street map with open source software, with U.S. federal programs to talk about how those make work to get make working together worthwhile. Uh, I do want to remind you all that Phosphor G North America is coming up in October, and you still have two days, or today and tomorrow, to submit a talk if you want to submit a talk. And Fed Geo Day will be a workshop as part of Phosphor G North America. So I will put in that shameless plug. I want to add, uh, just to amplify a little bit on the introduction of the panel, uh, just in order here, sitting next to me is Todd Daybold, who is the Chief Data Officer at the U.S. Department of Interior, a longtime friend to open data and open source software and the, the geo platform and getting data out to all of us. So uh, anyway, the thank you Todd for participating. And then Carrie Stokes, who many of you know, she's been very active in the OSM community. She's the chief geographer and the Geo Center Director at USAID. And then uh, beyond uh, Carrie is um, someone I just met today, but I'm really excited to meet Ryan Hathaway who is the director of the White House Environmental Justice Interagency Count um, uh, that has a lot of exciting uh, things to share with us today, which is great. And then last but not least, certainly is Josh Campbell, who many of you know is now, he's the GIS architect in the Office of the Geographer at Global Issues at the U.S. State Department and also runs uh, Sand Hill Geographics if you meet a very interior geographic project problem solved. Josh is your man. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, without further ado, let's just get going with the panel. And I would like to start, and I'll start with, we'll just go down the line here. Um, and the first question is, can you talk, Todd, can you talk about how your agency and its programs work with OSM and what benefits to Interior or other programs you see through that collaboration? Sure. So um, first of all, thank you all for having me and putting on this great conference, Maggie and your staff, uh, wonderful event. It, it's so welcoming to see a group of folks coming together to work on something bigger than themselves, bigger than the bottom dot line, bigger than, you know, right or left or center. Um, so, you know, when I think about how this organization and it's not an organization, it's all of you, right? It's a community and a community of shared values that actually intersect really nicely with the Department of Interior. Um, you saw some of the key programs that OSF has up. Well, we have key programs focusing on environmental justice and equity across the communities we impact. Um, we have programs for Native American education that would absolutely benefit from, you know, interspersing geography and history into their curriculum uh, to think about the lands that they live on. And when we think about trails, well, of course, you know, we're interior, we, we do have one fifth of the land mass of the U.S. We have a lot of trails and we want them used respectfully by the citizens of the United States and others. On a, they're a resource on a, along with our wildlife refuges and all the other great limits we manage on behalf of you, the American people. So in terms of how do we partner with OSM, we don't partner enough. Um, and, and part of why I'm here is to figure out why is that? What are the barriers that are holding us from doing more together? Um, does it mean everything's public domain data? Uh, you know, I was talking to some people about tribal sovereignty, that there's a lot of information on tribal lands that is not meant for the U.S. government. It shouldn't be in our hands. They're sovereign nations. Um, how do we work with that in an open street map environment? So there's there's tons of opportunities. And I'm hopeful, uh, based on some of the groundwork that, you know, friends in transportation 
and in my own agency, USGS had done to break down some of those barriers that we're going to do a lot more together. Uh, and I hope within the next few months, you'll hear about some agreements that the Department of Interior enters into with OSM. So looking forward to those days. And keep up all the good work, folks. Community stuff matters. Big time. It's about the people. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Gary, can you talk to us about how USAID and OSM collaboration is working with your Dan? So happy to. Are you near me? Is it working? You can. I can't hear myself, so that's why I'm asking. Great. Okay. Well, everything that Todd said, I agree with, of course. Uh, the people matter. The community matters. And um, at USAID, which is the U.S. Agency for International Development, so we're going to take your domestic hat off for the moment in the last uh, uh, conversation, and now we're going international. Um, we are the foreign assistance lead for the U.S. government. We have a presence in about 100 countries, five regions, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Middle East and Eastern Europe. And we work to help communities, people, communities, families, um, progress beyond poverty and grow their economy and increase their voices in the democratic process. We work in the countries to respond when disasters hit. We work in countries to improve health outcomes, to improve opportunities for education for boys and girls. Everything that a country may need to develop is what my agency does. My team, the GeoCenter, the team of geographers and data analysts and remote sensing specialists, and we work directly with our colleagues, both in Washington, D.C., where the USA headquarters is based, and in the countries where we have our field offices. And our role is pretty fascinating. We, we apply something called the geographic approach to development. And this whole concept is that with a presence in so many different places, geography is critical to understanding where are the needs the greatest? Where are we already working? Do those two match up? Sometimes they do, sometimes they may not. And how well are our programs performing? Are they performing as we expected? Are they performing in some places better than others? Well, why might that be? So as geographers, we get to get, we have this opportunity to get involved with all sectors in which USAID works, which keeps our jobs very interesting. And in all geographies where we work, we provide direct guidance and what we call technical assistance to our colleagues to help them make the very best decisions they can about where we should be placing our programs and where other donors may also be working so that we can possibly leverage those investments together. So with that as an understanding about what my team does internally for our, for our agency, now I will talk to you about why does OSN matter? We had a program called Youth Matters. Raise your hand if you have heard of Matt Frutters. Ooh, I love to see this. Okay, the majority of the room, that's great. So Youth Matters is a, based on a consortium um, of universities. And many of us are in the room right now. We have representatives from GW University, West Virginia University, Texas Tech University, and I think, I hope, maybe at least one person from Arizona State, ASU University. Those were the beginning, yes. And now Youth Mathers is in more than 370 universities around the world and more than 70 countries. So this program has grown since it got its beginning in 2015. And the whole idea of being youth members is to create opportunities for young people in universities to learn digital mapping skills and learn leadership skills to better understand the needs of their communities and the development challenges and to get involved with help to solve. So how do we do that? We use OSM. OSM is critical. This is the platform that we all use. And we could not have created the Youth Mappers program without having first had a platform to use and to build upon and continue to contribute to. 
So OSM is really critical because it allows USA to create new data in undermapped places all over the world where we're working. And that can give voice to communities that have never been represented before. It also allows us to better understand where we can get involved in communities in the youth in particular. Because really, we all know, the future is our youth today. And our youth are leaders today, not just into the future. So OSM is truly the platform that we will continue to work with, continue to partner, continue to invest in, because it touches upon all of the sectors and the areas that I mentioned about where we can work. So with that, I almost gave it. It's funny. But Ryan's got a bike there. Oh, thanks, Ryan. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Can everyone hear me? All right. Um, how's everyone doing this morning? You know? Okay. Good. Well, I, I appreciate the chance to be here. I work for the White House Council on Environment. I am the first environmental justice director that is a career agency position. So it's a position of very low pressure um, for me. And I love it. I, I won't do the normal White House thing of coming here and just taking credit for all the things other agencies are doing within the federal government. Um, but I, I will talk a little bit about like why environmental justice matters to this work and, and, and OSM. So the president, as well as all of us on the team, believe that everyone should have access to clean air, clean water, healthy environment, regardless where they live, that you shouldn't be overburdened by pollution or toxic waste or be denied access to nature just because of your census tract or your zip code or because of historical practices. And, and so one of the things that happened in the first week of this administration was, was signing of Executive Order 1408. And that asked us as the Council of Environmental Quality, now I say us, this is before I joined, but it asked us to develop a tool called the Climate and, e Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. And, and that tool, it is meant as a, uh, 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 basically a assistant and tool to the Justice 40 initiative, which is an initiative so that 40% of certain federal investments go to communities that are overburdened and historically underinvested in by a myriad of uh, uh, indicators. And all those indicators are viewed on a map, right? And so one of the most basic things that our map has is OSM as our base layer. It, it allows us to show people where they are in relation to what we see as overburdened, disadvantaged communities. And it helps federal agencies who have, we have over 450 covered programs in Justice 40. It allows them to see where these burdens are and target their investments under this initiative to make sure that the communities that deserve help the most and need help and are the most overburdened are actually getting our investments um, as, as a federal government. And I, that, it's a historic effort. It is hard. We're on version 1.0 of CJUST. But one of the really important things to us is knowing that our data is nationally consistent, that it is open source, that it's publicly available, and, and that folks have an equitable representation on the data that we are using to make these decisions. Because we have two really historic, big legislation is the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act that we're talking like once in a generation level investments. And we want to make sure that those are actually going out to the communities that need those investments the most. Um, and I, I used to live with Todd at the Department of Interior. To, to this day, at Interior, at the White House, it's very rare for me to be in a briefing where eventually someone doesn't go, well, do you have a map, right? And can you put this on a map? Can you show us where this happens on a map? Uh, and so the mapping data that we are using to make our decisions is open, has input from communities. Communities have the ability to use it, to see themselves, to put themselves on there, to document what is important to them. And that is what we are using to make our decisions. That's going to result in better decisions across the board. Um, so I'm really supportive of everything that Todd and everyone on our panel is mentioning in terms of federal tools. But we actually have our own at the White House, and we use OSM as well. Great. Thanks, Josh. That's fantastic. Um, so a couple of things I got I got to start with. Um, Lee always 
it, if there were, it's all be short yesterday, that's who I work for. Um, and uh, so I do have to give the caveat, the standard caveat, this in my opinion, should not be construed as full of state department policy. Um, but, but a little bit about, I think it's important to kind of understand state department. It's easy to think of this organization in, in a monolithic block, but it's not. I kind of describe it as a braided rope. There's about 30 different mission sets and they're all kind of uh, in their own strand. So it's really difficult to talk about just what the state department in quotes would do. Um, so the office of the geographer um, portfolio is somewhat specific um, and it focuses primarily on human security issues. So uh, food, migration, climate adaptation and change, um, refugees, humanitarian crises, natural disasters. Uh, additionally, there are the geographic cons uh, responsibilities of maintaining the international boundaries data set for the U.S. government, uh, participating in the uh, Foreign Geographic Names Committee. Um, and then we've recently undertaken uh, governance, a governance rule as the Geospatial Data Act um, has come out. And the geographer is also the senior agency official for geospatial information. Um, so I spent a lot of time going between technical stuff and uh, policy stuff. Um, the time our, our GGI's role, the Office of Geography Global Issues role with OSM um, probably reached its high point a few years ago with the imagery to the crowd and map gift programs. Um, and I could talk a little bit more about what we were trying to do there, but I, I wanted to step back for just a second. I went and read this morning uh, the, the, the joint strategic plan between the Department of State and USA um, and would, would say that I, you know, free and open access to high quality geospatial data uh, aligns with and supports several of the strategic goals in that in that document to include human security, health security, climate mitigation, adaption, human humanitarian assistance, peace and conflict resolution, sustainable economic development, promoting good governance, and advancing equity. And that's those are just the ones that are kind of outward facing. There's also an internal goals about better use of data strategic asset, a data centric culture, and data informed decision making. And I think OSM in that broader matrix of how does the State Department writ large as the enterprise leverage geographic information plays a critical role in each of those. But in each of these mission sets, it's going to kind of vary, I think, where the utility is, what the level of engagement would be. Um, the fourth office in GGI was the humanitarian information unit, which was designed to kind of bridge the gap between uh, formal institutions and the NGOs uh, that would be working in humanitarian crises. And that's where we did all of the work with imagery to the crowd, where we're trying to um, again, it's a problem that doesn't really exist today, but, you know, 15 years ago, 13 years ago after Haiti, uh, access to recent quality satellite imagery constrained uh, mapping efforts for humanitarian and disaster response. And so what we did there was try to step in and leverage the purchasing power of the United States government with commercial imagery and provision that out to, to essentially catalyze volunteer behavior um, or volunteer contributions into OpenStreetMap without having to own the technical stack, without having to do anything, to simply try to be an accelerant to uh, leveraging the goodwill and cognitive surplus of globally distributed volunteers um, to produce data in areas where we knew it was needed. Um, and since the commercial providers have kind of come in and overwhelmed any capacity we would have to provision that, which was the goal, so mission accomplished, I guess, on, on our side, uh, we don't really have to do that anymore. So to that extent, uh, our direct engagement with OSM has, has tapered off, but has really, our efforts and outreach have, have pivoted to be more about how do you drive uh, the adoption of geographic data into local communities and drive uh, data into decision-making and action. Um, and that's something that Youth Mappers has, has done tremendously well. So again, we haven't had to do a whole lot because they have really been carrying the ball there. Um, so with that, I'll have to follow to Rebecca and can well, I, it, it's a real honor to be in this group of, you know, volunteer mappers, a citizen grassroots initiative based mapper, mappy efforts. And I guess the, my next question for the panel is how do you um, see that, or what do you see as the key values of having this resource, this force of OSM and volunteer mapping? Um, in collaboration with your federal work and federal programs, and what would that 
what value do your program and to society could working the, their work specifically and get? Okay, one one very straightforward and blunt. For those that don't know me, I am extremely blunt. It must be something like growing up in Buffalo. But um, the straightforward is there are holes in our data on the federal level, uh, especially within of our Grand Interior. You know, if, if you can think about our national parks and our, our wildlife refuges, they're unique entities in a way. Some have lots of resources and some have almost none. Uh, so when it comes to providing citizen services, like where is a trail, where is the restroom, basic things on a map, we don't have, right? So it's an obvious solution. It's sitting across the, the room here and across the America. Let the people tell us where the dang trails are. It's about that simple. Uh, then on the more philosophical side of things, which, you know, you, who hasn't played with chat GBT, right? Yeah. Or some other form of AI. And it's, it's phenomenal and it's disruptive. Um, and when you start thinking about the use of data to inform policy decisions, whether they're internal to the U.S. or external uh, with our, our allies, what's the source of truth? And the integrity of that information. Um, so from a federal government standpoint, we're at a tipping point, right? We used to be the trusted source. That, that isn't the case in today's world. We sell our trusted source, but now you got to kind of question, right? Is it U.S. data or not? Uh, what's the data integrity? OSM actually provides a way to mitigate that risk a little bit. By putting more eyes on data, whether it's our own or a local communities or someone else's project, it mitigates the risks of false information being pushed and pulled into our decision-making apparatus. I know that sounds theoretical and all the rest of it, but it, it's a real concern for me and others in the administration as we you know, try to navigate the new world, just like you all are trying to navigate the new information world. So that's an opportunity space that I want to collaborate on uh, with our partners in, in OSM and others. Kerry knew the coming kind of got filling out this earlier, elaborating even more on the value of volunteer mapping. Yes. So um, similar to the U.S., one would think we have everything mapped in this country. Well, this group knows we died. Um, from the presentations I've seen yesterday about all the pools in New York City being mapped or all the playgrounds being mapped, there's always some more features on the ground that they not yet been captured. But that said, this country has a lot more data than the countries where USAID works. So OSM is really critical to what I would call citizen engagement. In many countries where the stability of the political system and the economic system um, is, is really not there, um, I do see at OSM in both a practical tool and a philosophical one because I see it as the epitome of digital democracy. It gives power to the people to put themselves on a map, a common platform that everybody can see and comment on or uh, edit, as we say. So in, a pl and in, in my job, working in so many countries of the world that are trying to reach greater stability, um, both economically, socially, and politically, having a tool like OSM, I think, is absolutely critical in this process today. It also allows for people to get involved with digital tools in parts of the world where that is not always um, accessible to everybody. So here in this country, we can see kids from age 12 on up, you know, holding a cell phone, and a smartphone at that. That's not necessarily the case in the countries where USA works, but it is becoming, of course, more um, popular. The data is critical for the kind of decisions that health communities develop. So from improving food security by met working with smallholder farmers, women farmers, for example, in Tanzania, to be able to demarcate the, the fields that they work in, um, is important because they don't already have land titles and land tenure. 
And then the inheritance laws in other countries um, do not necessarily mean that if their husband dies, that they will then get access to the land that they need to grow food to feed their families. So most people wouldn't think about the connection between a satellite image, a digital mapping platform, and why that helps with food security for a, a family in a rural part of Tanzania. But that is, in fact, the link. Because when you have a tight end to your land, you now have access um, to re a resource that in this country can be taken for granted. Uh, in other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, we are using this information to help uh, prevent malaria. Again, one would wonder, what is the connection between a satellite image and a mosquito? Mosquitoes carry malaria. And malaria is one of the biggest killers of children under five in Sub-Saharan Africa. USAID is engaged in a long-term effort to reduce um, this health crisis. So to spray individual homes takes a lot of effort. It's very resource intensive. You need the right insecticide and you need to have enough so that when you get out to the place you're going to spray, you already know in advance how many homes you need to target. How do we do that? Well, we only work with local people to help man the places in advance so that the spray campaigns can go out with the correct amount of insecticide and ensure that the full effort will be effective. So these are examples of how one would not have ever necessarily connected the dots on, literally connecting dots sometimes, as we, as we math teachers, uh, on why this kind of platform is so critical to people's health. During the COVID pandemic, um, having people map health sites, hot spots where COVID outbreaks were critical um, in critical places was important for uh, humanitarian organizations and governments to be able to respond adequately. Improving um, uh, environmental resilience and climate change adaptation opportunities where we can map areas that have historically been flood prone and may be further flood prone so that communities can properly respond. All of these areas could not be, we couldn't be doing what we're doing right now if we didn't have OSN. So to be able to take part in the definition of uh, your community on a map that the world can see is, as I said earlier, I feel like this is, the, this is one way a voice cannot just be heard, but can be seen and can be shared and be um, respected. So in my opinion, OSM, for the work that we do is just, as I said, the epitome of digital democracy. It gives power to the people um, to be able to define uh, where they are. So, buy it. That's a disruption in the fall. No, <laughs> it's not art. So I'll say before I, I came here, I started looking on our tool that uses OSM, and I, I didn't say within about a five-minute walk, there are several communities here that we know are overburdened, um, higher risk of asthma, higher uh, exposure to traffic pollution, uh, blood paint exposure in the 90th percentile, low income, be the low, and the, you know, actually, let me ask this. You all know this, this is a room of people who like maps. Where's North? Anyone want to point me to North? Correct. Okay. I cheated and used, I, 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 I used my phone right before I asked that, so I would know if you were right. So about the five minute walk. I'm gratified that the rich would. 2023. Yeah. I'm glad you asked which way is north and not south. Well, I'm not a Dutch. So about a five minute walk that way are several census tracts full of communities that were historically redlined. Um, that was a, a practice of denying mortgages to people because of the color of their skin and because of their income level, because of a perceived risk with that. Now, that's almost over a hundred year old practice, but we know that there are consequences and burdens that are still on communities because of that historic practice. I've seen research that shows that they have a higher temperature they been like a higher physical temperature, that higher higher heat exposure, higher rates of asthma. Uh, they are more likely to be low income and have a lack of family wealth and generational wealth. Um, for them to be able to have a tool that allows them to put themselves on a map so that they can be considered to actually start to get some 
some form of assistance and aid and to know that they can actually see themselves being recognized and see this burden being recognized is a pretty meaningful, uh, it's a pretty, pretty meaningful practice. Uh, and so I, I don't think I can, I can't say that we are there yet, but we are committed to getting there. And I think that having open source of data and having a chance for people to have a say in the way they are shown on a map really matters when it comes to decision making. And, and so for us to have a tool that is trying to do this and direct funding to these communities allows us to say to the entire federal government, I, in April, on April 21st, the president signed another environmental justice executive order. And it said that environmental justice is required to be in the mission of every single federal agency, regardless of what they do. Right. And, and that is part of this recognition that we are at a time <laughs> where if people have these conditions and these burdens that they are living in, that they deserve a say and how they are treated and how we resolve those burdens going forward. And, and so I think having open source maps and having open street map and having people be able to actually put themselves on a map. I went in before coming here and put my house. Uh, I followed a YouTube video and went and mapped my house and then my neighbor's house. And, you know, it's a, it's a fun activity for me, but for some folks that, is, that can be a matter of great significance for whether or not they receive the aid that they deserve, whether or not they're able to show themselves on a grant application to get a grant to build a community health center. Um, it's not lost on me that probably last night families sat down realizing their child had asthma or cancer or some other thing and had to have a conversation that I myself have never and probably will never have to have because of privileges I have inherent to, to my life. Um, and it, that is not the future that we are, we are not working towards a future. We want more of those conversations. We want to make sure that people actually have a say and have the power in the information they need to access the resources they need to address, address the issues that they're facing. Um, and it's, it's one that is definitely, um, it is, um, a moment of import here for us because there is so much investment on the table right now in our country. It is, it is a once in a lifetime opportunity to make sure that that gets to the people that need it and that people get a chance to actually even have a shot at it. And, and so having information, geographic information that allows them to apply for grants, like I've said, is it, it's historic. It really does change the outcomes for some people. One, 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 one. You're on. So, you know, again, thinking back to what's in it for the community, not the federal government, what Ryan said is absolutely true, right? I got that executive order and was asked, how the heck are we going to handle this with the myriad hundreds of different programs across by the party? The reality, though, is the federal government doesn't have all the answers here. And for communities to get heard requires your assistance and the community itself rising up to talk about the problems that they face at their scale. A national map is great. And, you know, I helped develop the product that Ryan's speaking of, but it's got holes, it's got gaps. It, it flattens out the data so that you don't see some areas that have, you know, a lot of challenges because they're masked by, you know, wealth. Um, that's where OSN and the community itself can step in, help the government understand and use your voice to say those trillions of dollars that are available through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the IRA are needed here, not there. So please use your power. Giant. Well, I'll take it a slightly different tack at it because everyone here has spoken passionately about, you know, the various application spaces where it can match. Um, if you step back and like your a role as a, as working for the government is ultimately on some level to be a good steward of taxpayer dollars and crowdsourcing or commons based peer production models have fundamentally changed the economics of knowledge production. 
And so as a government employee, as a steward of investment, that dynamic alone kind of forces that you have to pay attention. Um, when you combine uh, the essentially decreasing cost to produce geographic data through OSM with the fact that the search capacity to produce data in times when timelines are short, uh, when the government couldn't even pick up a pen to begin to procure said data. Um, th those two things alone, the potential cost structure and the timing, all those demands that government employees consider this kind of institution and organization and kind of, I think, provides a driving force for why figuring out how to overcome any institutional hurdles to engagement uh, should be undertaken. Well, um, that actually is a really good lead in because I'm going to skip to a, a, a slightly more technical question here in the, so we were, I was really, Happy to see the public domain map presentation yesterday. That's that's great, and uh, that's a very specific example. Um, but can you all talk about new areas or new technology or uh, things like public domain map and how that might help in your work more specifically? Uh, kind of drilling down on your point there, Josh. Don, want to start or chair? Very soft. Uh, so, I mean, this is, yeah, Eddie, thanks for the question. And PD map is kind of a changer, or, or at least my organization, where, you know, data collected on federal lands with federal dollars, or it's the U.S., it, it's your data, right? And we don't want restrictions on it. We want to make it available for all to use, whether it's commercial or private, doesn't matter. Um, the way the licensing model works with OSN, we, we had some friction there and, you know, many hours with attorneys is never fun. Uh, but, you know, thanks to partners and creativity and persistence, you know, we looked what was happening in the international space. We're like, well, state department's doing this, USA's doing this. How, how, how do they make it work? And then, you know, I had a gentleman over here for transportation said, well, I'm willing to stick my neck out, try it for railroad. And I'm like, cool. He, he put the work in and he, he did the pilot. So now we're at a place where we've got the pilot solved, the technology's in place. The lawyers will always be there, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> but we'll, we'll tackle them one department at a time and we're going to open this up, right? We're going to make this work. So that's, that's like groundbreaking for, at least from my perspective. So I'm really stoked. You know, Carrie, I have to say that when I think about this question, I, I think that the like youth mappers is like the a, an ultimate win, win, win. It's kind of a, it's kind of a tech, it's kind of a solution. It's got, and, and I'm also reminded that this is like the biggest group of mappers that I see. Since all the youth mappers in Florence at Foster G. North, where what the day before with You've ever here. If you weren't there, you would be so amazed at the outpour and the number of people that. Anyway, so uh, what do you think about technology and moving forward? That sure. Okay, I might be jumping ahead here, but um, uh, I am dreaming, and I've been dreaming for a while. Uh, and I can't claim that this is my idea because I didn't put the name to it. But I would love to see. Chad GOPT be able to do this. Bring me demographic data from the Kenya census that's cleaned, structured, and ready to be analyzed. I want to see it bring me climate data. I want to see it tell me where in the country of Kenya are the young people concentrated in the poorest places. I want to see it tell me where are the least educated girls in the country. And then I, a human, want to take that and generate insights from it. The process of collecting the data, verifying the data, filling in the holes, taming it, organizing it and, and then that analyzing, of course, the analysis is actually the fun part too, but it's the generating of the insights that is so critical 
to be able to provide to policymakers, decision makers at the local, the regional, the national levels. My team did this work. It took us over a year. We worked with data from the country of Kenya. We worked with more than 15 data sets, some published by uh, the World Bank, some published by uh, international organizations who we trusted, as well as local organizations. And the human effort that it entailed was long and tedious. So what I would love to see is the idea of either chatting the way we do today or speaking directly. And I'm, I, I'm looking at in the call right now because I know you had a whole session on this yesterday. I missed it, unfortunately. Uh, but the concept is, is one that I'm dreaming of because being able to truly put not just a map of where things are, but where we can decide things should be because we can layer easily. I am using the old fashioned term layer from GIS. We could combine, mash up, cookie cut the part of a work that we're interested to see, that's really putting data in the hands of people uh, to really be informed by the decisions that they need to make. And we're not there yet, but the, the, I'm not going to stop dreaming about it because I actually think that that will leapfrog everybody, not just those of us who are geographers who are passionate about place uh, and geography, but Actually, um, and beyond where we need to go with our Apple Maps or Google Maps or OSN, you know, telling us where we need to go, but to actually do deeper analytics on a daily basis that inform um, so much of our our daily lives and our community lives and our our, our governments interacting with us. Thanks, Brian. You guys have a tool. Yeah, we have, we have a tool. But every so if we're going to talk about technology of the future, and I can have a small moment to dream. I, I, I think what I would love to see is a world in which the capacity that it takes for communities to apply for the assistance they need is something that is filled by information. Because I, you know, we talk, we talked about neighborhoods around here. They're all on over the U S but what we hear time and again, when we go out and engage with areas that have environmental justice concerns is that, you know, these are bigger single mothers working three jobs with one day off a month at that. The, the time for them to go in and use any tool to pull together any amount of information that's required for them to get the assistance that they need to get that funding. Applying for grants is not necessary. It's getting easier, but it's not an easy process and it's varied. So if I, I would love to, one, take the silos that we always have to work in in the federal government and find ways to build bridges between them so that our agencies are sharing the practices so that DLI and DOT can share what DOE can share with education and labor and all of our other cabinet agencies and say, this is, this is we figured out a better way to do this. You should take this and, and do it yourself. Um, and then I would, I would love to see us get a, a tool or a, a way for communities to not have to go through so many barriers just to get considered for their, their aid, for things that are going to help them uh, deal with pollution and deal with local landfills, deal with all the things that they are, they are already dealing with so much. Life is not easy, period. Right. It is a lot harder when you are adjacent to or smack in the middle of a place like Cancer Alley, right? Where you have so, so many things, so many burdens stacked up against you. The expectation that you're going to find the time and really some truly amazing people do. But if we can reduce those barriers and the, and the burden it takes for folks to actually just tell their story and get considered, I, I, you know, I think that. It's not an impossible task. It's one we're working towards, but I think that would be a huge game changer. And, and I think that's something that this community here can help with, right? As Don was saying, if you can help people know where things are happening and help give a voice to communities, the more refined our information is for decision-making, the better those decisions are going to be. Um, I, 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 that to me is a feature that I would love to see cop with technology. I think there's ways to get there. But I also think it's sometimes just just people power, right? The power of this community. So it's not technology. It's people deciding they care enough to help out other people. Um, I'll focus more. I, 
specifically, I think there are some structural things that impede uh, the government OSM interface that need to be tackled in order to drive greater adoption. Um, one of the responsibilities of government data is to have really good provenience of where you got your data. And that doesn't necessarily flow with OSM workflows. And so I would like, I would want to see the OSM community engage. Uh, I think some of this comes from the imagery providers. Now we're doing so much from satellite imagery for the government to really be able to leverage the data. I need to know the date, the imagery was that you digitize that thing. I need to know the sensor model. I need to know the precision standards. Um, as we build this quilt of data that is differentially updated, um, this mosaic is a really complex thing to understand. And we've got to do better, I think, at getting some of that provenience um, of the data linked into the vectors themselves. Um, and that would feed into conflation issues. You know, what happens now as you try to get OSM data, if it has been collected in a way that is under public domain, because as U.S. government with data assets, we've got to release them as public domain mandate. Um, so you've got to be able to drive conflation. And then as a broader geospatial uh, organization, our metadata standards are insufficient to deal with this kind of data. Metadata now deals with things at the layer level, not the feature level. And so we don't have a standardized way to describe a feature that is changing at a pace that's different than a, a vector that's adjacent to it. Um, so I think if we can begin to work towards solving, having technical bridges across those worlds, I think that opens up the ability for the government to more easily work with, engage, and adopt uh, OSM derived data into official government data sets. So we have about three more minutes. And so we're going to go out with that group photo right after this. On the income? Yeah. Yeah. So we can, we're going to have a though OSM the government uh, round table at 130. So I'm asking, right, you've been guessing. I don't know, right? I know you've been pulled back into the vortex of whenever, <laughs> but. Um, this has been, so please, if you have questions, you grab us at the photo or at the one thirty session. I, I would, I just want to give a chance for everybody to wrap up there. I think Josh, that's great. Todd, I think you have a, a, a statement that you want to make. I have a shameless plug. Yeah. So, uh, mo most don't know, but I'm a metadata nerd. So Josh here triggered me and, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was trying to. Oh, right. <laughs> so there, there is an effort underway right now. It, the U.S. is trying desperately to update its federal metadata standard. And I know standards, lawyers, they, they kind of get thrown into the same camp. But if you're interested and you are passionate about metadata, we need to hear your requirements. So if you go to GitHub and you look for DCAT-US, you can actually post your requirements from your community what you want to see in the federal standard. And we'll take those requirements. We're going to wrap them into a schema and the schema is going to be back out for the world to comment on. So it is a new open source way of doing standards through the federal government. Please help us. I need to hear from you. I'll add them. Carrie. Sir. So just on that, I want to just remind people, we are all the government. The government is made up of us. It's not some far off thing. It's not just a sound bite for politicians to throw out in a quick interview or a tweet to blame everything on. Um, our, we are our government. And um, those of us who are up here aren't necessarily elected officials, but we are in the executive branch. We execute what the legislative branch mandates us to do. And we're people just like you, and we're trying to do our very best with the resources that we have. They never stiff, you know, like they're enough. With the people that we have, dedicated, passionate, trying to make public goods the best that they can be. So our government only works as well as those who are participating in it and contributing in any way you possibly can. And I just, I, I just as a public servant for now, Oh my goodness, I'm dating myself. Uh, 26 years. Um, I'm, I'm defensive when I hear people say, oh, that the government did this. Like, the government isn't the, it's Benny. Yeah. It's, it's a patchwork quilt of many people who joined 
uh, to be public servants in some form or another in some agency, some department. And uh, remember that we're doing the best with what we have, but we can only be as good as those citizens who also have their input and share that with us so we can have this circular process to be the best government we can for. Right. You want to have a, a close state. It sounds like you're valuable to be part of this. She can help you even more. Yeah. Well, it's on. It's on. Okay. Uh, I, I'll just say, um, I talked a lot about our climbing economic justice screening tool. Uh, as one of the things we really want to get right and continue to improve upon. And we have a link there for feedback. So please go onto that site, look at it, give us feedback. People who understand this world of mapping and data and how to improve it, uh, that is really useful feedback to us. It is no small effort to do this for every federal agency in a way that is open and consistent across the entire country. Um, it, it, it makes it hard to get all of the data pieces we want. Um, but it's too important for us to not do. And can they just Google climate and economic justice tool? I promise you, if you, if you Google climate and economic justice screening tool or CJUST, C-E-J-S-T, uh, you will find it. Um, and it is hosted by our, our lovely partners at DOI on the GEO platform. So, then Josh, any begging for your remarks? So, uh, and you, yeah, uh, no, thanks. Um, you know, everyone's kind of got their passion project, and that's what makes the quarters of OSM great, right? Um, mine is international humanitarian response, Maui. Um, and so I would encourage everyone if that's not uh, an avenue that you drove. Uh, tried to go down, uh, looking at stuff from the humanitarian open street map team, um, and getting involved with tasks that, that they have prioritized is a great way to, uh, make your contributions in, in time and while they can, they can help people. Thank you. Well, we're out of time. I, Megan, thank you very much for allowing us to share. And, um, I'll let you tell us what we're going to do again. Thank you. Can we, Ben, can we? Thank you.